talk about mistakes because my, in my experience, private equity folks have been the best business analysts in the world. Whether you're talking about automation, implementing AI, or just doing uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics, the, whatever models you build are only as good as the data that you have. What, what's your interpretation of what actually portfolio companies could be utilizing from an artificial intelligence to maybe support them with you know, some of this digital transformation and, and utilization and, and clarity on data? Welcome back to the new and revised Raw Selection Private Equity Podcast. So joining us today is Glenn Hopper an experienced, technology-focused chief financial officer and author of the book, Deep Finance. Today is all about digital transformation with a focus around data and also exploring the mystery and giving us an indication, especially me, an indication around what AI is, how we can potentially use it for our portfolio companies and how we can become more abreast of how we may be able to use that now or potential in the future. Before we jump into the podcast, if you are listening and you would be able to take a minute, I appreciate you busy in your private equity firms, portfolio companies, or however you spend your time, um, but your interest in private equity is just by leaving a review on whichever platform you use to listen to the private equity podcast. I get so many fantastic messages from people within the industry, thanking for the insight, thanking the guests for giving the opportunity to share what is a little bit of a hidden and dark art of private equity, but it just gives us a bit of an option to be able to reach out to others and promote the podcast in a little bit more detail. So if you do have a minute, don't ask for much, but if you can, drop a little review and a five-star if possible or a one-star with some feedback. I will read the comments and we are continually making improvements. But let's jump into the podcast. Welcome and thank you very much for joining us and sharing your insights so, Glenn, if you could give us a 60 to 90 second breakdown of you, please. Sure. Uh, I've been in corporate finance for about uh, 25 years now, 15 years of that as a CFO, uh, mostly private equity backed companies, but uh, kind of across the board um, from bootstrapped to private placement to VC to private equity. So um, really my whole career um, since my, my first role in finance has been in the startup space. Um, and being in the startup space, I found early on that if you want to get the attention of investors and uh, show a level of operational excellence, you have to be able to report on your data uh, as, as a larger company would. So in a startup space, having very small teams, the only way I was going to do that was through automation and uh, you know sort of whether it's citizen developing or, or working with the uh, developers in the company to build out these systems. So my entire and I came up uh, in the finance ranks not through the CPA and audit track, but through um, FP&A actually was where I started. So I've always kind of considered myself a business analyst first, and that sort of informs everything I do. Um, so uh, in the startup space for a couple of decades, and in recent years. I've been, I've moved from a role where I would come in and help companies sell to private equity um, or strategic purchase a couple of times. And uh, as of late, I've really shifted my focus as the uh, demand has gone in this direction to really focusing on data maturity and every, I mean, and that the interesting thing with data maturity is whether I'm going into a company that's getting audit ready or IPO ready, or just wants to build an FP&A program, data is is kind of at the heart of that, whether it's support for an audit or coming up with KPIs or, or whatever it is. So I've really, to me, uh, data, finance, technology um, have all been linked from the beginning. Looking forward to this conversation. Private equity is all about finance and all about data. So what's one mistake that you see private equity firms or portfolio companies making and what actions would you suggest to correct them? Yeah, you know... I'm hesitant to uh, talk about mistakes because my, in my experience, private equity folks have been the best business analysts in the world. I mean, that's kind of <laughs> what they do. Um, and really, I think of us as the, we're the original BI uh, people in, um, in the way that uh, 
private equity has looked at um, has looked at companies and driven them their portfolio companies to get better at uh, at reporting and understanding you know what those metrics are and what adds value to a company. Um, I do think that maybe not a mistake, but maybe just the nature of where things are when you're moving quickly and you've got a timeline and an exit strategy. Uh, sometimes it's hard to step back, get a macro view of all the data you're managing and look at how can we make this easier? Because there's, I mean, we're still in a world of spreadsheets. There's all these other tools out there, but all the analysis that happens, I mean, someone 90% of the time is going to be in a spreadsheet doing <laughs> index match and, and VLOOKUP or, or whatever to, uh, to pull this information together. So I would say... Um, not just in, in private equity, but kind of across the industry, there's change and transformation can be difficult because people are very good at Excel. They know what they do. And then changing that, they worry that the time that it takes to slow down and make a change to use more automation and to maybe reassess the data and look at easier ways to do this. It's hard to let your foot off the gas to go uh, do that analysis and, and look at how you can maybe change to, to get more efficient in the future. Makes sense. So digital transformation, you mentioned that in the 60 to 90 second breakdown. What should portfolio companies be doing regarding what is a very hot topic? And what's your take on what the private equity firms should be implementing or supporting or driving as initiatives into those portfolio companies and also the portfolio executives focusing on it towards, towards digital transformation and improvement? Sure. Uh, let me hit the portfolio companies first. Um, I think with the portfolio companies, um, it they need to make sure if if they're going to be going through due diligence and, and investors are looking at their company, they need to make sure they've got a really tight handle on their data. They need to understand what the source of truth is for any information they're delivering. They need to have, just as if you're going into an audit, they need to have support for everything that they say they need to if you've got one piece of information in your crm and your pipeline and another uh piece of information in your general ledger or your erp make sure you know which one of those is a source of truth if they're different be able to explain that variant so i think for the portfolio companies it's really about operational excellence understanding your data understanding the meaningful kpis and levers that you pull that can influence the company so that that's part of your pitch is okay this is what we're doing now but with investment this is how we would use the investment and this is this isn't a hunch this is data backed uh you know this is our hypothesis this is how we prove it so for the portfolio companies it's really on operational excellence using that data to um add business value um, and truthfully, if you have, if you're a portfolio company, if you have a level of automation and data maturity, that's almost uh, intellectual IP. It's it's part of your operational excellence. It's part of your value play. It's look, you're you're rolling up, you know, a hundred veterinary clinics, but our veterinary clinic, we can track, you know, patient patient data, whatever it is, on, on a much higher level than typical businesses of our size. That's where you're going to add additional value to the company. And for the portfolio companies, the challenge is when you're, I mean, sorry, for the private equity companies, when you're rolling up all these different companies all over the country, all over the world, whatever it is, completely different systems, completely different ways of tracking data, um, you know, and you're trying to aggregate to, to measure across your, the different portfolio companies, it's, you want to make sure that you have apples to apples comparisons across them and find a way to consolidate and aggregate that data so you can look at them holistically. Like you could go in to any one of your companies and see their individual dashboard, but how difficult is it to then go and look at the broad, at, at the entire portfolio and understand, I mean, you can do it with, with financial statements, obviously, and you can, you know, you come up with the EBITDA and, and where you're tracking them there, but to get to the meat of those true operational KPIs, like understanding where um, where each company is and being sure that you're measuring common variables across all of them. Sorry to interrupt, just a quick mention of our long-standing partnership with Grata. As you will probably know, the private equity scene is constantly evolving. And 
deal flow is moving now to proprietary and data-driven processes. Grata provides you with the data and information of over 7 million private companies. So if you're looking to improve your proprietary deal flow and improve the data access, then reach out to Grata today. Now back to the podcast. Okay, so a few things to, to question on that. So one was, um, you know, getting all this this data and putting it all into a, a clear perspective. And as you said, the financial data can be fairly simple and private equity um, in the most part know all those details and have it all in the face of them, providing the exec teams presented it. But looking at some of the more intricate data, which they may not have, which is basically your key decision makers or leading and lagging uh, data uh how do they, what kind of tools, What? how do they pull this together? How do they measure? How do they review? Um, what What could private equity firms be doing around that? Yeah, and this is, um, this is a very difficult, because it's an investment, because you have to have, you know, human capital plus the investment in whatever software you're using. But the idea of a consolidated and aggregated data lake, data warehouse, wherever it is, where you can in, wh- whether it's, Tableau or Power BI or, or, or whatever, that you are bringing this data into a consolidated place and you've got a quick view of it um, across all the portfolio companies uh, so that you can look at them holistically. And I'm I'm always careful not to, you know, shill for any one product over another, but the but conceptually the idea of bringing the data into one place, because whether you're talking about automation, implementing AI, or just doing uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics, th- th- whatever models you build are only as good as the data that you have. So are you uh, looking at this data from a piecemeal perspective, company by company, or can you look across the portfolio and look at not just the um, internal data from those companies, but being able to build into your models external data Um from sources, whether it's in the market or the macro economy, um, whatever the case may be, it's uh, really about how quickly, like think about how much time goes into pulling these reports together and aggregating data, whether you're going to the the team at the portfolio companies or doing it within the PE firm, finding ways to to have quick access to the data where instead of having to, you know, put in a a request from the company and wait for people to manually pull that and assemble reports that once you have a, a data lexicon and data ag- aggregation and you know what you're pulling and then whether it's through APIs or through some software system being able to connect to that data and quickly get it then you're spending more time adding value to the data than you are consolidating and assembling reports and so what you mentioned about the portfolio side is was data truth and yeah, I know from from raw selection, executive search firm, we can look at all sorts of different uh, bits of. Um, I keep saying data now. I've got American uh, bits of data. If I go back to my British uh, pronunciation, um, if I look at different data, will tell me different things, and I may have one data that tells me one thing, or I may interpret the data to tell me to do something when actually what I should be doing is something else. And I'm sure that's something we've all come uh, come across. Now, there's obviously going to be different bits of data that we need to look at and talk about, but is there a broad way that you've found of being able to quantify what's the right decision um, with regards to which one is the truth um, data and which one's accurate? I know that might be too much of a big question without specifics, but hopefully you can give us some guidance there, Glenn. Yeah, actually. So <laughs> I, um, it's funny because talking about automation and, and this year AI, everybody's talking about, but really it's um, you have to go back to a fundamental level below it. And I always think when I come into a new company, how I must be immediately be like the most hated person at the company, because if I'm coming in as CFO or as an outside consultant, um, I'm thought of as you're the finance guy. But the first thing that I do when I come into a company is I think of it, well, it's sort of an ISO 9000 audit. Not that I care that any company that I've been, if not that the ISO 9000 certification is what I'm looking for, but this is, and I'm sure I'm dating myself here by talking about something as old as ISO 9000, but I like to look at the process from 
customer uh, prospect lead early in the sales funnel, all the way through deals one, they're onboarded, whatever project management. So rather than starting with the system and the data that you have presented to you, I go back to the real tangible world of what data are we collecting along the way, which identify, you know, in knowing when you collect it. So maybe you have a, a point of contact in the CRM when someone's early on and then you may get a billing contact that's a person's name and that, that goes into the CRM. But by the time you get them into your ERP, there's actually a billing email or something. But so you may have two different billing contacts. But as if you walk through the process of a customer life cycle, you can understand what um, which truth source should be used. Um, and you can also, that's all, in that audit, so I, did, I see what data is available, what data is collected where, what data is passed from one system to another, and if there's potentially something that's overwriting from one system and another, should it be, should it be two-way information? And also in doing that analysis, it goes back to the operational excellence I referenced earlier. You when you do that analysis, you find where the roadblocks are. And that gives you keys of, okay, this is something we need to look at op optimizing. And it gives you ideas of what's scalable and what's not. So, um, you know, I think the, the role of, of finance has, has shifted significantly. And I, I think as automation and digital transformation and AI continues to grow, it's going to continue to shift to where you're not just reporting sort of the rearview mirror, the financial statements and what happened, but you're going to be a bigger part in the rest of those KPIs. And, and you'll be able to have more informed forecasts because you have more data internal and external along the way. But identifying those roadblocks, finding areas of automation, automation and data are linked together in, in, in my mind, because when you automate something and you know it's passing through from one system to another, that's another data point that you can have. So I think if you step back from just, okay, I've got this huge CSV or this huge database with, um, you know, a hundred different features in it. Um, and I'm just going to run a model on the data that I have. If you step back to look at, okay, if I got customer age or customer churn prediction or what, you know, whatever the data is that I have, where did it come from? And if you ask that question first, and if you're looking at across a group of portfolio companies, then you kind of have a template to apply to each of the companies and look to see if they're consistent in that. Not only am I the host of the Private Equity Podcast, but I'm also the founder and managing partner of Raw Selection. Raw Selection is a private equity specialist executive search firm with two divisions, one that focuses on portfolio C-suite executive hires, and one that focuses on private equity direct hires of your back office and investment deal professionals to the industry. Alongside the podcast, we're passionate about giving back to the industry and giving people information that they can run and utilize. One thing we do regularly every year is we run salary reports on accurate and live data of people that we've interviewed and people that have shared their information with us. So if you're looking to compare your current compensation or your compensation for your next hire in your private equity firm or portfolio company, then please check out our YouTube channel and see the playlist of salary surveys. So, the, you mentioned the play of, of artificial intelligence. Now, with it's an overused topic currently and, and used heavily in clickbait uh, for no doubt podcasts and YouTube videos and everything else. Um, what's your take on what can actually be implemented? Because I think there's still a perception, although Elon Musk is terrified, maybe not terrified, that's not fair, but he's concerned about uh, what's going to happen with uh, artificial intelligence. We've all seen, you know, chat GPT and, we logged in and then logged out and not gone back on. But what what's your interpretation of what actually portfolio companies could be utilizing from an artificial intelligence to maybe support them with, you know, some of this digital transformation and, and utilization and, and clarity on data? Yeah, very timely question. And one that I've been dealing, because I, I mostly deal in the SMB space, you know, dealing with PE backed and uh, startup companies that don't have the, the, amount of data, they don't have the budget they, of, of a big enterprise company. So they're, they've got this uh, fear of missing out on, oh, oh we're not doing AI, you know, uh, we're going to get left behind. And I, I do 100% agree, if you're not moving in that direction, you're going to get left behind. But the truth of the matter today is 
generative AI, chat GPT, BARD, uh, you know, all the image gem generators and everything that are out there are, like you said, they can be great clickbait. They're amazing tools. We're, to me, this, we're in the early stages of uh, AOL dial up where you're, you know, taking two minutes to, to log in, uh, but every, we see the potential there. And so for right now, I, I, I can answer this question two ways. I can talk about what sort of the SMB space can be doing right now to get ready for it. And there, there's so much AI out there that people never got any attention. It's been, a, you know, we've been using AI in, in recommendation engines and in clustering and, and, and predictive algorithms for well over a decade now uh, to great success. But that's just a bunch of statistics and math going on under the hood and nobody wants to really talk about that. Um, but with generative AI, we are seeing a new world out there, but even I, I think boards are talking about this. I think senior management's talking about this. Investors are talking about this, but as far as today, practical in-house, we're, we're kind of limited. You're, you're seeing some of the big players in the, in the SaaS industry and, and software industry starting to incorporate generative AI in the form of a chat bot so that you can interact with your financial statements and with whatever your data is. And that's, that's great. And we can go down that road of um, what's I see in the next five, certainly 10 years as very possible and, and things. And actually every time I make a prediction, it ends up coming true in like one tenth of the time that I said it was going to. So if I say five years, that may mean five months. <laughs> um, but where, for most people that I talk to right now, it's just what we've been talking about on this podcast. It's get your data house in order, understand what data you have. And then there are, I mean, there's drag and drop tools out there that do this. And I know if you're under 25 million or so in revenue, you probably don't have, you know, you may have one data science person who's doing everything from engineer to report writing and all that. But um, there are steps you can take to be ready um, when these tools are broadly available and less expensive than, say, OpenAI for enterprise or the Microsoft Azure setup or whatever, those are all fine and good for enterprise level companies. But for the SMBs, they're they're just not cost effective yet. So what people can be doing today is getting their data house in order. The first thing you do is sort of um, a diagnostic look at your data, and you understand. Your, where your customers are based on the data you have them. You start to see trends. You can do clustering in your, uh, this is that's just a basic machine, like a K-means clustering algorithm, a basic thing that says you can do customer segmentation. And if you haven't ever done an exercise like that, it's, it can be incredibly valuable on the sales and marketing side, which also then goes into the finance side. If you're building a budget and a forecast and you're considering several different marketing plans, if you have this customer segmentation and you have, you know, you move into predictive analytics about which customers buy what, it can help shape your models and, and drive decisions. Um, and these are all things that we can do today. And there are tools out there uh, that, that will let you do this, but first you have to get a handle on your data. Now, um, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of commitment. It takes a team. But if you, this is the first step towards when generative AI is less expensive, more broadly available, more secure, that you don't have this sort of proprietary and uh, personal information and, and company information, the, the worries about what happens to that. Generative AI really is going to open up a new world because all the stuff that I was just talking about right now, you've got, there are some drag and drop tools, but you've got to have someone who writes Python, who understands how to make machine learning algorithms and who understands who is a, a data scientist so that they know that you can use this model on this data. You have to throw out uh, these rows because there's bad data in there and it's going to mess up your model. You've got to have someone who's an expert in that. And then you've also got to have the domain experts. But the promise of generative AI and these chatbots is they can take your questions in context. And then if they've been fine-tuned on your company's data, then you're in a whole new world where everything from data analysis uh, and predictive modeling in your investments, optimizing exit strategies, uh, your portfolio management by looking at KPIs and spotting emerging trends and future challenges. I mean, machines are much better at 
uh, spotting trends and, and variances than people are and can do it in real time. But first, you've got to get your data in order. And you know you can do all this today, but with generative AI instead of Python, English, or whatever your uh, spoken language is, that becomes the new programming language. So instead of having to go to a data scientist with a, a chat bot that's tuned on whatever broad, you know, reading the whole internet and reading all your finance and accounting documentation that you need, but then it also is backed up by the data in your company. Suddenly you're, you're chatting with a, a trusted advisor. We, we have hallucination and other things to overcome, but that's the promise of it. Um, and that's why I think people right now, I'm not going out and selling anybody. We're going to put a, a chat bot in and you're, you're going to be able to fire half your financial analyst teams. We're, we're not there, but we're moving in that direction. And if you want to, uh, not necessarily of firing people because I'm a big proponent of upskilling and reskilling. And instead of, uh, you know, having that many people doing data entry and compiling reports, you actually have that many people um, uh, adding, adding value to the company by doing that human in the loop part interpretation and adding additional value beyond what these algorithms can. So that was a mouthful and I've got more, but I'm going to pause there because I feel like I've been rambling for 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, you are here to, you are here to ramble, Glenn. If I was telling you about AI, it'd be a very short conversation. And I would tell you that chat GP, GT, uh, GPT exists and you should have to take it out. And that's probably as much as I, uh, uh, I would know, but hence why you're, uh, you're doing the talking and I'm uh, certainly doing the listening. So, Okay, so it seems that there's some options. It seems that generative AI well, just just help with definitions here because I'm I'm not familiar with what when we say generative AI and AI is generative AI ChatGPT and what's what's the difference? Yeah, and I uh, I have to always fight the urge to get really pedantic on all this because I just I love I think I'm in another life I must have been a college professor or something but uh yeah just to to back up in in some definitions on this so AI in general just the broad field of having a machine that can uh mimic human uh thought or, or you know human activity whether it's self-driving car recommendation engines rule-based chatbots decision trees whatever that's all the broad field of AI which is just a you know part of computer science within that is machine learning which is these algorithms that um, can learn by the de from data. And that's really been the explosion of AI in the last 15 years is um, with the addition of more powerful compute, more data than ever available, being able to train these algorithms. And what traditional machine learning has done is really two things, classification or regression. So it can either, you feed it a thousand pictures of a cat, and then it trains the algorithm and then it can identify that's a cat. So that's classification. And then prediction is just regression and you know, with various different models, but it is here's some time series data, predict what's gonna happen next. So that's traditional machine learning that's um, based on these algorithms that learn from the data. The breakthrough on generative AI is instead of just continuing a trend or classifying something that already exists, generative AI actually generates new data, new text based on what it was trained on. So over the past 12, 18 months, the large language models, the uh, the transformer, the uh, image creation, the now video and, and audio creation, these are all generative AI that is generating something new based on what it was trained on rather than just doing that classification or um, prediction. Makes sense. I've certainly uh, learned something there uh, on uh, on defining it. So from what you're saying is there's definitely tools out there to help us do analysis, to help us bring data together. Um, should If I'm uh, interested in this, interested in this for the portfolio company, even interested in this for the private equity firm, wh where do I go to look to potentially learn more about this, to bring more into the forefront and then be ready when there is technology that's drag and drop and i don't need uh you know as you put python uh, engineer or whatever they call them developers to come in um that i can be there how, how do i how would i if i wish to do so stay on top of of, of the world of ai and understanding it and and maybe not being at the forefront but just being more aware yeah there's and i don't the, I get this question all the time and I, I need to put together and actually I just had a conversation with a CFO who's in his 60s yesterday and he said, I don't know what AI is. Everybody's telling me I've got to get on board with this. Where do I start? So 
it, 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 we're talking about all this data and all this information. And the problem is there's so much information out there. How do you know where to start? You know, you could start with YouTube videos, books. I mean, I could make, you know, specific recommendations on stuff like that. But truthfully, I think it is, you can't do it in a vacuum. I think the management team has to look at AI in general with whether, you know, the CTO, the C well, in thinking about pr uh, private equity groups now, I mean, certainly there are a lot of uh, uh, smart people, technology investors, NPE firms. I think taking the input from the, the team that you have, understanding where you want to go, what you want to do with it, but then it's a matter of how deep do you want to go? Do you want to take um, a uh, an overview course, understanding what AI is? Do you want to follow, you know, certain news articles, newsletters, I think I subscribed to half a dozen of them easy, um, that, you know, every day there's some spam in my inbox that, well, I invited it, so I guess it's not really spam, but, um, or are you going to really dive in, and depending on your, I would say for an analyst right now, if, if you're not already, and I think probably most of them are, I mean, diving deep into what goes beyond Excel and getting into more statistics and, and Python or R or whatever your programming is, I mean, these are the at that level, I would say you're diving in and you're taking, um, you know, courses in Python, learning how to do time series analysis and uh, all these other uh, applications. But I think more at the executive level, we have our domain expertise where we've been. And I don't care if you're in sales, marketing, operations, finance, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of, I understand you're an expert in this, but you're going to have to beef up your knowledge on this new area. So that could be everything from taking courses on Coursera to reading books out there to finding podcasts. And, um, and again, you know, I'd be happy maybe, you know, at the end of this, if uh, I could put together some recommended sources, if people wanted to uh, read or learn more, maybe we could include them in the show notes or something. But um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a broad question with a, a lot of, uh, answers to it and it depends on how deep you want to go down that rabbit hole okay well what we can do is if you can put some things together i'd be greatly appreciated glenn we can put that into the show notes and if there is people that want to begin to get a little bit more familiar with this um we can build something into that and uh and point you uh point you in the right direction um outside of kind of ai um i know you've written uh your own book uh glenn um which is based on corporate finance is that right Yes, yeah, so, uh, it was a couple of years ago, and it's um, at the time that I wrote the book, it was such a niche book, um, and I, you know, it's I, I was never going to retire on the royalties from sales of that book, but I, I was. It was about using machine learning, basically, in FP and FP&A, and how you can use these tools again if you know Python and if you and but talking about the power of using artificial intelligence in finance, and it, it was a niche book that wasn't really that accessible to a lot of people because they're busy doing their day job as a, a finance or a, accounting person. Um, but then in the last 12 to 18 months with the rise of generative AI and everybody talking and, and you're sort of riding the uh, Gartner um, hype cycle uh, all the way to the, the peak that, over the past 12 months, um, it's it's given me opportunity to talk a lot more about it. And it's I'd love to be out there saying, um, hey, this is great. Dive in, use this right now. You can use it in your business today. It's it's foolproof and, and all that. But that's really, I end up, as we did in this conversation, it just keeps rolling back to the hard work of data maturity and um, you know building out these systems and understanding what you have and sort of preparedness. But um, yeah, this has been, I don't know if... I, the last thing anybody would want to do is pay me to sit in front of a blinking cursor and write code. But I've, through my whole career, I've kind of been this citizen developer because I know what I want and I don't always have the uh, resources that I need to do it. So this has been a, a passion of mine for really from the beginning of my finance career. And um, uh, so now uh, with everybody talking about it, it's just kind of given me a bigger platform or a bigger audience to talk about this stuff. Thanks. And with regards to getting in touch with you, Glenn, if anybody wishes to reach out, how best do they get in touch with you, please? Um, I think LinkedIn is probably the, the best way. I'm not really on other, I think I have a Twitter or X account, but I post you know quarterly on that and I, I don't really follow it a lot. So LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me. Perfect. I am pretty active there. 
We will put that uh, in the show notes. Well, Glenn, well, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate your insight. Appreciate the deep dive or the, the shallow dive, should I say, actually, uh, and from your perspective uh, into artificial intelligence and uh, making people aware of what they can begin to look at. Again, we'll share that in the share, uh, show notes, should anybody wish to do so, uh, to explore that further. But I really appreciate you uh, going into the detail you have done on, uh, on everything uh, digital transformation. Alex, I really appreciate you having me. This was fine. And as always, to our listeners, thank you very much for joining us. Should you ever need support with your private equity hiring or portfolio executive hiring across Europe or North America, please do reach out to us at Raw Selection. If you've not already, please do subscribe to the podcast. You'll be notified of the next one that comes out, which, as you hopefully should know, is now every single week. So till the next time, keep smashing it. And thank you very much for listening.